Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Ann Merklinger. I work with Own the Podium. I hope you are all staying safe and well. Welcome to the Gowling WLG webinar on financial support for sport organizations during COVID-19. I'm pleased to introduce Roberto Alberto. He's a partner in Gowling WLG's Ottawa office, practicing in municipal law and litigation. Roberto's practice includes complex litigation matters and alternative dispute resolution. Roberto also manages numerous client relationships at Gowling WLG, including for various sport organizations. Roberto has also sat on numerous boards of sport organizations and is currently the National Sport Commissioner for Lifesaving Sport in Canada. Roberto is a former captain of Wilfrid Laurier University varsity swim team and also coach swimming at the club and university level, both in Canada and the United States. Roberto, thanks very much to you and your team for hosting this webinar and I'll turn it over to you now. Well, th thank you so much for the introduction, Anne. And welcome everybody. I know we've got people from across the country here today and uh, appreciate having you all here. We hope you're all keeping well and staying healthy. I've got my headphones on to make sure that we're avoiding participation from my dogs. I'm sure everybody has had enough opportunities to meet people's dogs and cats uh, in the last few weeks. Um, so we'll try and keep things as focused as possible. As a starting point, I'd just like to introduce you to our panel. Jemiah Ferdinand Hodkin is a litigation partner in Gallic WLG's Ottawa office, and she is certified in risk management. She's a member of Gallic WLG's sports law team and represents athletes, organizations, and corporations in litigation and dispute resolution. She has appeared at all level of courts uh, in Ontario, as well as tribunals, panels, and uh, other uh, boards. Jemai has never competed at a national level, but has played competitive baseball, basketball, and volleyball, and has competed in cycling, running, cross-country skiing, and triathlons. She's also coached volleyball, swimming, and trained athletes for Ironman triathlons and other triathlon competitions. Colin Green is a corporate tax partner in Gowling WLG's Ottawa office. His clients include registered charities, not-for-profits, and for-profit entities. He assists clients in pursuing their corporate objectives, both tax-driven and otherwise. Arriving at his undergraduate university, Colin discovered he was too short at six foot two to play offside on the Queen's varsity volleyball team. And he stumbled into a love of ultimate Frisbee and has competed for Canada at the national level. As an interesting an anecdote, uh, Colin met his partner through Ultimate Frisbee. I met my partner through a lifeguard competition. Uh, so certainly uh, very, very embedded in sport uh, in each of our households. This may also be an introduction for many of you to Gally WLG. Um, Gally WLG has over 700 professionals across Canada and over 1,500 professionals around the world. We are servicing clients across the nation. Gally WLG are the legal advisors uh, and first sponsor for the Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games. And Galley WLG is counsel for the consortium that is putting in a bid for the city of Hamilton for the 2030 Commonwealth Games. A few housekeeping points, and I know people have been submitting uh, points already, which is great. The slide deck will be made available after the webinar and the webinar is being recorded. So it will be posted on Galley WLG's COVID-19 uh, website. So if you, gal if you Google Gowling WLG and COVID-19. There's a ton of resources in there. We will be joining those resources. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, of great resources, including another webinar in the employment context that we'll talk a little bit about. We're gonna do our best to get these posted within 48 hours. Um, if you have questions throughout, please submit your questions through the Q&A function. You'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a chat and a Q&A function. We'll see how it goes and we'll do our best to consolidate if there's sort of a, a major question or two that has a broad meaning. But otherwise, what we're going to do is take the questions and prepare a, a questions and answers document and send it out to everybody who's registered. Um, so we'll do our best to, to answer questions. The more spat, fact specific, the more challenging it may be. Um, and again, as there's over 1,200 people registered for this webinar, we've got people from varying uh, organizations from you know single person small local club to large NSOs and so we're going to try and keep things relevant to everybody uh, as much as possible which may mean that it's a little bit more general and our contact information is included at the end of the slide deck uh, and on our website so again we're happy to follow up with inquiries there. We're going to cover a lot of ground today the federal programs reflect our best information at this point in time 
but it is a moving target. Again, substantial information released on Wednesday afternoon. So lucky, lucky we have Colin Green and, and the tax group to uh, weave through that mess. Uh, and it'll be great to see what sense we can make of that today and see if we can provide some clarity. But it's critical that you're checking the sources and seeking qualified legal advice. There's no one size fits all solution. Uh, and this is, so this is not intended to be legal advice, but it should hopefully get you a starting point. Um, and, and again, we are a webinar, so from a law firm. So again, we have to have our legal disclaimer up there. Um, it's current as of April 3, 2020, but again, please check. We're focusing as much as possible on the federal level. There are different nuances in different jurisdictions. We'll talk a little bit about some jurisdictions, including Ontario, but we're trying to keep it again as broad and high level as possible and focused on the uh, federal programs. So with that said, I'll turn it over to Colin Green. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, good afternoon. Well, I guess good morning to our West Coast affiliates. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you today. As you can see from the slide, we have a lot of material to go through. Just as a brief aside before we start, it's, it's always interesting when you have the collision between sport and professional lives. So I appreciate the number of teammates and sporting colleagues at the national level that I've, I've played with that have touched base that are on the call in various capacities. So as you'll see here on our first slide, we have five main areas. And, and really, these are the announcements that we have. This is one of those unique times we put aside our critiques of government policy and we focus on the base mechanics. What's being released? What's being offered? What's the shortest, quickest way that we can help you, our clients, get dollars into your pockets to keep as many employees uh, in the chairs as possible or, to be appropriate, working from home safely uh, and soundly as possible? Because really, that's what these programs are designed to do. In many instances, these programs are incomplete. That's not a critique of government. That's simply a statement of fact. We're 48 hours removed from having the front end release of uh, number two on this list, which is one of the most comprehensive and wide ranging and complex pieces. And we don't even have the full legislation. So I really appreciate that there are going to be questions. We will release information with the updates as we get them. The other thing that's very interesting is that this is one of the first times that we've seen complete crossover where they're applying these programs, not just to for-profit, but to not-for-profit. And given that these are income tested, this will create a number of really interesting challenges. Let's proceed. So work sharing program. What this is, is this is effectively a three-way agreement, a multiplayer agreement, if you will, between employees that work for you, the employer and Service Canada. In this agreement, the entities agree to assist with layoffs when there is a temporary decrease in business activity. This is a traditional tool, but what we've seen the government do is take this and expand it, update it, and try and make it more COVID row ready for the you know, instability that is to come. What this does is it provides EI benefits to eligible employees who agree to reduce their normal working hours and share the available work while the employer recovers. Work sharing units are therefore a group of employees with similar job duties who agree to reduce the hours and share the work. In terms of what the government has told us for the COVID-19 measures, we know that this is from March 15, 2020 through. So we have a full year of access to the program. And we've seen an extension to the maximum duration of the program, 76 weeks instead of 38 weeks. And we see the wave mandatory cooling off period. What this means is that this program is one of the first ones that's effectively ready on a fairly immediate basis. Now I say fairly immediate basis because please note that there's still a 30 day period. I want to highlight for you that I've put together a calendar in terms of the various timepieces that the various programs are slated to be available, but we'll also make an effort to flag timing as we move forward. What this means is that businesses that have only been in for even one year, as opposed to who are still eligible. And the thought for this is to use a mechanism to allow the government to assist employees to stay with their organization, to keep control over their organization groups. So here, when we look at the eligibility requirements for employers, we see year round in business for one year. We see private businesses held publicly, sorry, company or not-for-profit organizations, and we have to have at least two employees in a work sharing unit. If we proceed to slide eight, who does not apply? This does not apply to a labor dispute, a seasonal shortage of work, or a pre-existing or reoccurring production slowdown, a decrease in business activity due to recent increase in the size of a workforce. So what the government is telling us with this is this is not meant to be used as a seasonal component. Now that said, from speaking to government officials, we understand that this is going to be a unique time in government social assistance program. We understand that frankly, the benefit of the doubt will be extended to the vast majority of the program applicants that apply. However, if the government subsequently realized that someone was being nefarious in their application approach, they will respond fairly negatively in terms of, in terms of their approach and output. 
let's review the eligibility requirements for employees. Again, this is for year-round permanent full staff or part-time employees that are needed to carry on the day-to-day -day functions of the core staff of the business. These are employees who are eligible to receive EI benefits, and they agree to reduce normal working hours by the same percentage and to share available work. And, and this underscores a point that I think will we'll flow through all aspects of our presentation today. Because these are unique times, because these things are hitting us so quickly, and we're trying to respond effectively on the fly, the law as up to this point isn't really built for hairpin turns when it comes to changes to not-for-profit organizations or for-profit organizations with respect to the interrelation between their employees, the staff, and the government. Typically, these things take time. Planning is required. And so the more time and planning that we can buy you, and the more time and planning that you can bring in terms of planning ahead for these components, the more stabilized your organization will be. Now, obviously, we recognize that's a challenge with the fact that the government hasn't released full information yet, but it's still something that we want to keep in mind. A second component to this is that employee communication is key. And I think we can see anecdotally by looking at the success of various government entities as they have communicated throughout this health crisis, the government entities that have been transparent, forthcoming with information have received the best buy-in. And we would apply the same principle here, where you as an organization are able to review your available tactical options to settle on an employee route map, to look at your funding sources, and to then communicate at least some portion of that with an employee communication program. Typically, we've seen that those are the institutions and those are the areas where there has been far greater upkeep and there is more of a sense of cohesiveness to work because that is important. As we move down this road, we will run into employment law concepts, which we have put aside for today, such as reasonable notice or severance components. And we can mitigate the applications of those to just get to the right solution, bringing everyone together to create a compromise where we have good initial and early employee communication. So I would really encourage clients, and we would encourage our clients, to be thinking about their communication plan and their program application review. How does this fit within the scope of your organization? Next slide, slide 10. So who is ineligible? As discussed, seasonal employees and students hired for summer co-ops, casual or on-call employees, and employees needed to help generate work or who were essential to the business. Senior management, exec levels, outside sale reps, and technical employees engaged in product development. Of interest, also employees that have more than 40% of the voting share. So again, conceptually, this isn't meant for your you know, top level senior management team, this is in view for rank and file employees with essential scope. And this is our first starting program that we're reviewing because it's the one that already exists on the books. So the changes required, you see, were the most limited that the government has to deal with. So let's talk about the application process. Employers must submit applications 10 prior days to their requested start date. They have to submit two documents. We've listed the documents there. These can be ready found off of the canada.gc.ca site. We have links throughout the program. When the slides are available, you'll be able to access them yourselves or a quick Google will suffice for same. And you'll see that they even provide contact information. So on our next slide, we've provided them, although I will tell you from our efforts to, to contact the relevant government authorities, I respect that they're trying their best, but we should anticipate that it will be challenging to get timely response times from our government colleagues as they are effectively suffering through a deluge in terms of applicants. Slide 13. So what are the core recommendations that we have here through in terms of this? Have a plan, early communication, and we note that work sharing is less aggressive than termination. A lot of employees have considered this, sorry, employers have considered this because it lets them mitigate some of the risks that come with employee termination. You don't wanna lose some of your best core staff if necessary. You wanna maintain those personal assets so that you can maintain, number one, a sense of cohesive togetherness but also so that you can be poised to rebound insofar as possible and as aptly as possible coming out of the downturn. So there are definite tactical benefits to maintaining control of your employee pool, and this program can be something that many employers consider in terms of looking at. It's, it's an option. So again, this is only applicable to employees earning less than 63500 Otherwise, there will be a clawback to EO. Work sharing does not reduce eligibility for regular EI. Right? So while this product and program is ongoing, you maintain some EI options, and there's a 30-day waiting period for the program to take effect, again, assuming the application is approved. So our message here to individuals, to organizations, has been to consider your tactical options, to note the calendar dates that apply for you, and then to make sure that you're applying early. In many instances, that involves, frankly, a triumvirate between the accountant or CFO, your internal organization, and whoever your particular counsel is, even on a limited basis to make sure strategically your pieces are in place 
and your communication profile is in place. Okay, as we have a lot of material to consider, let's proceed to number two. This is the 75% temporary wage subsidy, or SUS, for lack of a better word. And we are 48 hours removed from everyone here knowing effectively the same amount of information that our tax team knew about it. So we are working off of fresh ground. I'm sure that most people are familiar with the background, but April 1, Finance Minister Bill Morneau released the details. This is effectively meant as an increase to the previous 10% subsidy program that had put in place. We'll get to the details of that in a second. I think the point here is that this is an example of a federal government within effectively a 12-day period realizing that their previous announcement of 10% rage remuneration and support wasn't going to cut it, coming back to the drawing board, effectively scrapping previous program, and then in live time, releasing government policy planning points. In effect, this is unprecedented, at least in my lifetime, in terms of these forms of policy announcements, timelines, and scope. So when we look at SUES, we see it's a $71 billion subsidy intended to support workers to maintain employment relationships and to reduce claims on the employment insurance regime. Again, I think what our government is signaling to us with this is that they want employees to be protected insofar as possible so that organizations can reduce their stress and in so doing reduce the stress of their employees, maintain near full employment insofar as possible, and let every individual focus on making sure they're flattening the curve. Slide. So SUSE is different, as we've indicated, from the previously announced 10% wage subsidy. SUSE is a cash subsidy paid by the government to employer, a reduction of payroll admittances, uh, sorry, versus a reduction of payroll admittances, which is what was previously envisaged. And one thing I'd like to highlight right off the bat, with SUSE, note that once the application period opens, everything is processed and cash is advanced, there is that dead period in the middle where organizations are still going to be needing to have a funding strategy in place to make sure that they are able to account and to realize their financial obligations. And we will review some of the loan strategies that the government has announced, but even those are beset by timing, timing differences, timing gaps. And so I would acknowledge without looking at our question list that we have had a high volume of for-profit, not-for-profit individuals asking us what form of policy programs we're seeing to account for that immediate gap. And to be honest with you, we don't have any you know, silver bullet magic answers. Instead, what we're telling people is to review their planning early to make sure that they're getting a grasp and full grip on their application programs to be modeling with their CFO and then seeing what other form of exterior funding organizations they can approach. Some of the FIs, financial institutions, have been working with multiple clients on this as well. But again, they're getting hit by a deluge of applications. So whatever you're going to be doing, we would recommend that it be done early. So again, eligible employers can apply for both SUS, which is what we're talking about, the 75% wage reduction, in addition to the 10% subsidy. However, if you receive the one, it will reduce the other. So there's no immediate benefit to being in one pool versus the other. The key difference that I would want to highlight for you is the 10% wage subsidy program, the previous program, was very limited in application. It provided for a maximum of $25,000 per employer. By contrast, SUS does not have an employer max. If you've got 500 employees, provided you meet the requirements, this can apply to everybody. So again, these programs are unparalleled in terms of their scope and reach and application for how quickly they've been rolled out. Next slide. Eligible employers, and we'll talk about that in a second, are given a temporary wage subsidy of 75% of the remuneration paid for a period of three months up to a max of 847 a week, or 75% of the employee's pre-crisis remuneration. Now again, this could actually cover more than 100% of the eligible remuneration if you've already reduced remuneration to pre-crisis level amounts, but we'll come back to that. That's just something that we expect the government will release further guidance. The wage subsidy itself is backdated to March 15, 2020. So, slide 19. Note the non-arms length employees are limited to 847 a week or 75% of the pre-crisis weekly remuneration. 20. Let's talk about eligible remuneration. What is included in this concept? This includes salary, wages, other remuneration, but excludes severance pay, value of stock option benefits, value of non-cash benefits, and salary paid to employee while the employee is eligible under SERB. We'll talk about SERB in a second, in a little while. Um, my apologies, there's a lot of acronyms. That's why I'm trying to provide the uh, outline of the acronym. If you look at the top of the slide, you'll see SUES, again, is the temporary wage subsidy. SERB, by contrast, is the program that has been put in place that also applies to independent contractors. And I want to bold highlight that because that in itself is unique as well, that this is one of the first times we're seeing policy programming for independent contractors. So again, 
if an employee is eligible under serve, there is some crossover, but we expect once everything is all said and done, there will be a clawback dollar for dollar in terms of how this applies. Uh, in answer to the anticipated questions, we don't have the government policy planning on that yet just because it hasn't been released. So I do apologize for being in an incomplete state, but hopefully people will cut us a little slack on that. Slide 21. Again, there is no overall cap, at least as currently announced, on the amount of the subsidy that an employer may claim. An employer may claim the subsidy in respect to remuneration paid to new employees as well. So SUSE is remuneration paid to employees and it does not extend to independent contractors. Again, there's a separate program for that, less generous in terms of its application, but still definitely something that will certainly be appreciated by many Canadians. So it'll be important to get a grasp on our separate categories of program that we have available. So let's talk about the types of eligible employers. Again, this is very broad. SUSE is available to any type of employer in Canada, whether an individual partnership corporation, not-for-profit or charity, and then it excludes public sector entities, municipalities, crown corps, universities, college schools, and hospitals. So if you're an NFP or registered charity, this is for you in terms of its application. And let's look at the qualification requirement. Employers must attest to a reduction of gross revenue of 30% in March, April, and May. Now, those are broken out as separate categories, and so this is foreseen as being to apply on a month-by-month -month basis for the three entities. Additional rules will be developed, we've been assured, for uh, the measure of revenue reduction for charities and NFP. We understand the criteria will be adapted to look for all sources of revenue. And here we anticipate from speaking uh, to groups that we will see it be a question of reduce of funding or revenue all in. I mean, the intent is for it to cover NFPs. NFPs and registered charities are clearly not running for-profit business models. But as of yet, we don't have the full release of this information. What we are suggesting, though, is that you should proceed, again, on a best efforts basis to be gathering the information in advance to show the drop-off of that revenue. You want to be in a position for when this opens, and we'll talk about that in a bit, to have that information in hand, to have reached out to your connecting accountant or your CFO and to have gathered that information so you're not caught flat-footed when this does go live. So again, employers are to take a best efforts approach to top up employees' salary to pre-crisis levels, but again, it, this appears to be a moving target. It's flexible, and we anticipate that employers will be granted latitude. If you're showing you went to 75%, but no further, but tried to save every employee that you could, you know, we're hard pressed to anticipate seeing a very critical federal government approach, but we just don't know. In terms of the application process, again, this is the employers and not the employees that apply for the program. And here we see that there'll be three claiming periods. You'll note I put March 15 in red because that is a backdated application for once it goes live. And the associated reference period is there for March 2020, for April 2020, and we presume for May 2020. So in each one month window, you would show that you had the corresponding drop in revenue, which is necessary to qualify your organization for this federal subsidy. Further query, without wanting to speculate into matters of health, if this crisis does extend or continue to mature, as we would say in the tax world, you know, query whether or not you'll see an extension of these government programs. Right now, we just don't know. What we do know is they're modeled and based on some of the Scandinavian approaches that we've seen, and those ones have been open-ended. And so there's reason for speculation that they may be open-ended in this instance as well. So applying for SUES. The most important piece of advice that we can give clients here is number one, we presume that all clients are using the My Business Account portal of CRA. That they have ready and easy access and there's no issues with that process. If there are, sort them out now would be your first recommendation. Two, we've been told that the timeline for release is anywhere from three to six weeks. So from a cash modeling perspective, this means you could be looking at anywhere from five to seven weeks for the release of this information. This could take us into the first week of May. So from a cash modeling perspective, you as an organization are looking for at least five weeks, if not more, to be prudent and conservative of cash modeling to, to make sure you're able to make ends meet. Again, the goal of SUSE is to put employers in a position to maintain full employment or to rehire laid off employees, but there is going to be that middle gap while they release the program. And again, the challenge you'll see is laid out here with respect to the lag of the payment and wages and the receipt of the subsidy, there is a requirement for finance. So with that, we can proceed in to looking at a few of the other components. SUS is obviously going to be included in the employer's income, but once it's received, you will receive a deduction for the amounts paid through employees. I recognize that's not of immediate relevance to RC, sorry, for registered charity or not-for-profit, but depending upon your filing status, you know, income balances, hitting your sheets could actually be a significant issue. So just note that there's an obvious deduction for the amount that's flowed through to employees. 
So the next step for the employers is to make sure you're registered with the account and to assemble the records to demonstrate the 30% reduction of gross revenues on the account of remuneration paid to employees. We don't have information right now in terms of the form of accounting or basics that are going to be applied to this, but what we are telling our clients is to make sure that you can be comprehensive in showing a drop-off. If there's been more than a 30% drop-off, all the better to make sure that you can document it clearly and succinctly to avoid any potential issues. Again, will directors are being prepared for NFPs, we suggest simply showing a drop in funding right now as a first starting. 28, so there are multiple unknowns of this program in terms of timing, clarity, and scope. But what we do know is we're three to five weeks away from hopefully at least seeing the program roll out. And we anticipate that this may be one of those times where the federal government is going to, you know, we're cautiously optimistic that they will hit this deadline just in view of the number, literally millions of Canadians that are going to be needing to take advantage via their employers for these organizational components. So while we apologize for the lack of clarity, we will update as we receive more information. This brings us to our third point, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, SERB. So you'll recall earlier in the acronym soup that we were trying to navigate our way through and talking about SUS, which we just talked about, we also mentioned SERB. That's this. And I would invite listeners, guests, to be thinking about this as effectively the independent contractor program. And that's what SERB is really geared to. So here we've been told that applications April, April 6, that applicants reapply every four weeks, and that the benefits are taxable. And so eligible applicants for SERB are Canadian residents at least 15 years old. They have stopped working because of COVID-19 or are eligible for employment insurance benefits. And again, here we may see some crossover where SERB is being used as a stopgap. Will employees or former employees are applying for EI and they had income of at least $5,000 in 2019 or the 12 months prior to that. And they're expected to be without employment or self-employment income for at least 14 consecutive days. So again, if we are in a position where we're seeing a stopgap release of employees and potential reclaiming of employees during uh, a SUS period, you know, that is something that we see as viable. There are questions in terms of how the clawback amounts or crediting of these amounts will work. Currently, we don't have full release of this information, but we are doing our best to get these information release answers from the government through a variety of sources, rest assured. So we've discussed the applicable elements. We've discussed the fact that there's a $5,000 income requirement. Again, this is from multiple sources, employment, self-employment, maternity, rental benefits, EI. Big picture, this is a program that also captures the gig economy. It captures your independent contractors. It captures people that were between jobs. So many instances we may see serve as a frontline response and is used by multiple applicants to get the program assistance that they need. Slide. So how do we apply online with my CRA recommend account? online with my CRA account or the automated phone service. Now, you'll know we've recommended the online account. Again, just in our experience, this is by far the better approach. It's the quicker approach. And in addition to this, and as an extension, we would be suggesting to people to make sure their online account access is currently ready. In many instances, there's a delay in terms of getting access to you. So if you're worried about whether or not you or your employees are going to be able to access this, I think part of your communication plan is thinking about how you want to message to employees to be making sure that they'll use this because they will likely need their my account for any wide number of government programs that are going to be applied for so you can probably subtly suggest to your employees they have this without telegraphing to them that there may be some form of reduction in terms of what's occurring it's all about the messaging next slide so here you'll see that we have a i don't want to say hunger games to lottery but effectively a rotating lottery application starting for the year of birth for the application through. We don't have full information from our federal government in terms of the application through, but we anticipate that they'll deal with the deluge of applications by volume in terms of, you know, date of birthdays by month for the application through. And given that it's compressed enough, we're hopeful that they will process all of the applications within a relatively short period of time. Okay, this brings us to our fourth component, the Canada Emergency Business Loan Accounts. And again, the philosophy underlining this, I think, we would probably all agree with is the government is releasing social programming designed via CERB, which we just looked at, to help independent contractors or others on a short term cash supply. Fine. They're looking at employment subsidy via the employer, again, to put the employer in the position of funding through to the employees through SUES. That's very helpful as well. But in all instances, we're noting there's this gap. And it's the question of what do we do with the gap? And here we've taken the first. Uh, business loan line credit that we've seen the most of our queries about, but there are other programs that are out there. 
And what we see through the business loans account, the emergency business loans account, is this is indicated as a $40,000 loan guaranteed by the government, interest-free for the first year. And again, the purpose is to help operating costs during a period where revenues have been temporarily reduced. We anticipate that this may be expanded, but certainly we think that the underlying, although not perhaps directly spoken to purpose of this, is to try and help cover off the gap between this and the various other government funding protocols. Now that's an excellent concept in terms of what's there. Our concern is in the application and the timing of the application for the manner in which it will be addressed. And here you'll see that there's a repayment forgiveness component of up to $10,000. What we do know is the eligible requirements for NFPs and small business is that they must demonstrate between 50,000 and 1 million in payroll for 2019. So if you're above a million dollars in payroll, then you would need to look at one of the larger or more expanded financial government loan programs. Here we've seen outreach to BDC and EDC. Uh, those are Business Development Bank of Canada or the Exports Development Bank of Canada, but to look at also through contacting your financial institution. And, and the reason I say that is because the government here has clearly taken a bit of a uh, subrogation approach in terms of saying to contact your appropriate financial institution, which will then in turn contact BDC or EDC where appropriate. So what's interesting to this is we're seeing effectively an implied partnership between uh, our government and its goalposts for social programming. So we're seeing the employer, for example, be put in the position of managing the SUS, the 75% wage component. The employer applies, goes to the government, receives the funds, funds are dispersed. Or in this instance, the emergency loan account, again, we're seeing the employer, the NFP, approach its existing financial institution and then the existing financial institution assisting with the management and the mitigation of that. The, the challenge, of course, is that I don't think, and, and this is totally fair to their credit, I don't think the financial institutions, how could they, were fully ready more than a few days ago or a week ago, or really given a heads up that this application process is going to work in this manner. And so I think we're seeing all of those FIs wrestling, but doing their absolute best to get ahead of these application requirements in terms of sorting up funding requirements. So again, what are our recommendations? Well, not to beat a dead horse, but if you're the CFO or you're in charge of your plan for your organization, what's your line of credit status? What's your communication outreach to your existing financial institution? You know, we would suggest that you be doing outreach to your existing FI to be mentioning these programs and to be indicating your desire to be a part of them. Having a line of credit, frankly, from a, a credit tax nerd perspective, it's far better to have it and not need it than the inverse. So we are definitely encouraging our clients to be outreaching to their appropriate financial institution contact. If you don't have an appropriate financial institution contact, again, we would suggest get ahead of this curve insofar as possible. Now is the time for that outreach, as challenging as it may be. Get that contact and see what you can work out to make sure you have your pieces in place. So again, the timeline is Department of Finance has advised that the program will roll out in three weeks after March 27. So we're looking at something towards the mid to late April. So our hope is, is that individuals, businesses, and FPs will have this time to contact their FI to get their application protocols in place so that everything is set up to roll through. You know, we don't know if this will be feasible, but the goal is definitely to have this apply in such a way such that you know, the goal is for people to get through their, 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 their portion of April on a bridge component, advanced financing, but then a couple of weeks after that, to have these funds come through. And again, I'm not saying that to alarm parties. Our thought process here is to be providing information so that people can appropriately map out their sources of funding the timing that goes with those sources of funding, and then to construct their own messaging to employees and their own strategic and tactical approach. One last component. Again, this is not going to be of immediate import to our NFP uh, guests. However, many NFPs do run sub or side for-profit entities as, as funding side components. And if you are doing that, we would just highlight that there have been significant extensions to tax across the board. We've seen that in terms of the June filing for payment for corporate tax for businesses for GST. So just note there's significant lack attitude that's been provided. So in conclusion, concluding briefly, here's a calendar snapshot. April 9 for CERB applications opening, payments to flow through business leaders. May 1st, work sharing applications open. Middle of May, sues for government releases. And then equally, middle of May, the Canada Emergency Business Loans Account. So in conclusion, we're looking at this as seeing that we know that there's this gap in funding. And we know that every organization needs a plan, including an employee action plan and communication plan. And competent multi-layered tax and employment advice is critical. We're providing this as a starting point to provide you, our guests, with some of the tools for that, and we hope that it had been of interest. Thank you. All right, thanks, Colin. So I'm gonna address, uh, beyond the financial programs that Colin has talked about, um, the other tools that you might have to address some of the financial obligations that you're facing. 
So whether you're a local or international level, we appreciate that you've planned, likely for some years, uh, for events that were scheduled to take place in 2020. Take the Olympic and the Paralympic Games as an example. We understand that you've used exceptional resources already, financial and manpower. You've sent coaches, trainers, and athletes to the selected training sites. You made all of the bookings for all the training facilities, qualification events, and the games themselves. And now you're faced with the challenge of how to cancel or indefinitely postpone the bookings that you have made, be it the hotels, the facility rentals, the catering, the food services, equipment rentals, all to ensure that you're not losing tens of thousands of dollars, if not more. So while this is true to those involved at the international level, I'm sure it's equally true for organizations working locally, provincially, and nationally in addressing all of the events, facility rentals, and registration fees, um, and all those questions that you're likely facing. So our advice to you is very simple with respect to all of this, and I think it's consistent with the advice that Collins provided already, and that is act now and try to come to agreements with your contracting parties. One of the greatest messages that I've heard come through this pandemic is that we're all in this together. Many people are prepared to try and help others work through these times where they can. So act now, speak to stakeholders, and see what you can do to try and resolve the financial obligations that so many of the organizations are facing. So where do we suggest that you start? We suggest you look to the contracts themselves. There are multiple clauses in the contracts that might assist you with deferring or resolving your payment obligations. The main one that we're going to focus on today is a clause called force majeure, <clears throat> otherwise known as like the act of God clause. <clears throat> Essentially what these do is identify which of the contracting parties owns the problem. So I've put an example clause up on the screen for you to see. Um, I don't re recommend using this clause in your contracts going forward. Um, you would want to use a clause that's tailored to you and addresses additional issues. However, the sample clause is only to illustrate what I mean by a force measure clause. Let me try and give you an example of how this would typically be used. If we think of something like rowing, Team Canada sources their boats from Hudson Boat Works. They're getting new boats in preparation for the Olympics. Eight months before the Olympics, a tornado hits Hudson's manufacturing plants and the boats are destroyed. Hudson can't fulfill its obligations to supply boats to Rowing Canada on schedule as a result of this event. If they had used the sample force majeure clause that we have on the screen, it could apply to afford Hudson leeway to provide the, boat a few, the boats a few months later so that the whole contract doesn't fall through. If we're talking about an Ontario contract and the force majeure clause wasn't in the contract and Hudson could not deliver the boats on schedule, Hudson would have no protection from this situation despite it being entirely out of its control. The contract would be frustrated, which is a concept that we'll discuss a little bit later on, and brought to an end. Ultimately, that wouldn't benefit either of the parties in trying to get what they had originally contracted for. So how can we apply force majeure clauses here? <clears throat> I suggest it could assist you in navigating your obligations to pay for your hotels, pay for your equipment, pay for the food that you've already um, ordered at the originally scheduled time and either end the obligation entirely or defer payment until competition resumes. The first consideration in determining your potential recourse is the jurisdiction. So where are your contracts made or what do the contracts stipulate as being the governing jurisdiction? The contract may have a clause that states that all disputes will be resolved in Ontario and governed by the laws of Ontario meaning that the jurisdiction and governing law is Ontario. Some contracts aren't quite so clear in the way that they describe it, so further analysis is obviously required. This jurisdiction and governing law point is exceptionally important. If we take force majeure as an example, there's a huge difference in the advice that you'll receive if your contract is governed by Ontario law versus Quebec law. In Quebec, the Civil Code establishes that there's a force majeure clause to be read into the contract. On the other hand, if, Ontar if in Ontario, there's no force majeure clause in the contract, then you simply, you're simply out of luck and you'll have to deal with the effect of not being able to satisfy the contract, which goes back to the concept that I talked about previously of frustration. So once you've determined the jurisdiction and the governing law, there are four elements that are going to help you figure out whether force measure could help you. 
Does the event qualify as force measure? Is performance impossible? Could you have foreseen and mitigated the risk? And how do we fix this? So when we look at COVID-19, I'll go through these questions with you generally, but I can't really give you a definite answer as to force measure will help you relieve your potential contractual obligations without actually reviewing your contracts because every contract is different and it really does boil down to how your contract was worded and what's the triggering event that brings into play this force measure requirement. So the first question is, does this qualify as a force measure event? Well, what is the event that we're talking about? It, it, it has to be the starting point. So in COVID-19, is COVID-19 itself the force measure? It has been defined by the WHO as a pandemic. So some force measure clauses include pandemics in their list of triggering, triggering events. Um, so that might be the triggering event that you wanna use as your reason that this clause has to be triggered. But it's also considered a public health emergency. It's possible that COVID-19 itself is not what actually caused you to be unable to fulfill your contract. And if that's the case, it may be as a result of a government decision to restrict all non-essential travel or to close down the borders. And some force measure clauses do actually include government action, restriction, and regulation as a triggering event to allow force measure clauses to apply. The question that you therefore have to ask is were there any scenarios that, for that fit your particular circumstances identified in your contract that could allow it to apply, which would relieve you from your obligations? The second question is what's the cause? So understanding the cause as to why, you're, why it becomes impossible for you to fulfill the contract is important because without it being impossible, then force measure will not apply. It can't be inconvenient or improbable. It actually has to be impossible. Slide nine. Um, third, if you look to see, <clears throat> if, you, if you did see this coming, so the question now is foreseeability. Did you see this coming and how could you have done anything or could you have done anything earlier to have fixed it? At the outset of my presentation, I said that our advice was simple and that was to act now. And one of the main reasons for this advice is because of this foreseeability requirement. There is a very brief window to exercise a force measure clause, and that window is rapidly closing. The news is constant in terms of the increasingly severe restrictions being imposed across the world, and everyone is eyes wide open in terms of how this is snowballing. We know that the Olympics and Paralympics are being postponed. How long have we known? Was it foreseeable that we might not have been able to use our hotel reservations and food before the decision was made? Could we have canceled reservations before the games were actually postponed themselves? If not, did we act immediately after the games were postponed to take action? Have we tried to mitigate our losses and respond responsibly? All those questions lead into that idea of foreseeability. Lastly, think about what you want. What is your goal in terms of trying to exercise a force measure clause? Before you get too creative, your contract will likely specify the, release that, the relief that's available to you. So oftentimes that's a relaxation of the time period obligation. There might also be financial solutions available to you. But these clauses are not applied lightly. It will be an uphill battle, and it will be an uphill battle that you will lose if you sit on it too long. In addition to timing affecting the foreseeable aspect of the provision, some force measure clauses actually have strict timelines in terms of providing notice of your intention to rely on them. So if you fail to adhere to the notice provisions, then you'll likely be unable to carry out and rely on the clause. So your best option is to review your contract, find a lawyer in the contract's jurisdiction to come up with a plan as to how you'll negotiate a resolution, so that you can avoid a substantial financial loss to your organization should you have to pay despite not using the services. If force measure doesn't work, there's also the idea of frustration, which we briefly talked about earlier. And frustration is different than a force measure clause. It doesn't mean that you've written anything into your contract. It's not a nicely wrapped solution to resolve an aspect of your contract. It's essentially like a parachute. And if your contract is the burning plane, you just have to pull the pin and get out. 
When a contract is frustrated, the entire contract blows up. In force measure, you continue to work within the, the contract with the other party. You just excuse the party from, from fulfilling one aspect of the contract with an agreed upon resolution. Frustration is different. Frustration, everything is complete with respect to the contract. So I appreciate that all of these issues that we've been throwing at you may feel like a bit of a firing range. There are so many risks that COVID-19 has raised and many solution options are available to you. To help you organize your path through this crisis, I propose that you make use of the basic risk management toolkit to structure yourself and your organization for this week, this month, and this quarter. This structure will assist you in evaluating the interplay between all of these issues and prioritizing them based upon urgency and potential impact. So if you've not already done so, please try these steps. First, identify the risks, all of them. There are many tools to help you identify risks. You can bring in an outside consultant. One of the biggest ways I help clients is by working through identifying what their risks are, as opposed to the smaller task of actually determining how to fix them. The reason for this is that identifying risks is the cornerstone to being able to address them. Evidently, if you haven't spotted them, you'll be in no position to respond proactively. Sometimes having an outside set of eyes ask questions and evaluate the situation will help you identify risks that you have not even considered. Second, analyze them. What's the likelihood of the risk materializing and what is the consequence? Where you have a high likelihood and significant consequence risk, that's obviously an extreme risk that requires aggressive treatment. However, a low likelihood, low consequence risk may simply be something that we can accept and absorb and move forward. Evaluate which risks require additional treatment and in what order. Use your analysis to prioritize and organize your path forward. And then treatment. What mechanisms do you want to employ now as we progress through this crisis? Do we want to avoid, accept, transfer, or reduce? Something that is too high stakes, we may simply avoid the risk. If we can purchase insurance, if we can add a clause in a contract to transfer the risk, then perhaps we move forward with those mitigation steps in order to actually absorb the risk. Treatment doesn't have to be static though. So identify, analyze, evaluate, and treat in a cyclical fashion as we move through this crisis in order to continue to move forward in an organized way. So how, how do we suggest is the best approach to succeeding through this crisis? Act now, discuss with stakeholders, determine their flexibility. If you don't ask them to defer your hotel reservations, you'll never know if they'll agree. Start those conversations early. <clears throat> obtain expert advice. I'm not just saying the self-serving, obtain the lawyer, legal advice. Um, I'm also suggesting talk to your other trusted advisors, talk to your accountants, talk to your brokers, they might be able to assist you with identifying other areas that can assist you through this process. Review the various government funded support programs that, talk, that Colin talked about previously, and also communicate with your peers and your colleagues. They're living through this too, and they can be an invaluable source of support throughout this entire process. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen, and I'll turn it over to Roberto. Thanks, Jemaya. And yeah, that communication with other sport organizations, I mean, certainly in the legal industry, we're doing that. I know I was participating in a, a virtual meeting of law firms over 10 lawyers in Ottawa yesterday, and it's interesting to sort of hear some of the best practices. So it's certainly great advice there. Jemaya has spoken about force majeure clauses generally. Uh, I just want to talk about other sort of high level things to be evaluating when you're putting together your game plans to identify you know, sources of revenue and minimizing liabilities. You should be reviewing all of your major commercial contracts that may be impacted. This uh, for a number of reasons. One, you wanna make sure that you're not being surprised by future liabilities. Two, you wanna see if you can uh, potentially mitigate future liabilities. And three, there may be opportunities to optimize revenue, you know, a little bit of rejigging of timing and locations of things may still be able to work. Highly contextual, gonna depend on each circumstance, each specific contract, might be sponsorship agreements, uh, rental facility rental supplier contracts, 
Um, solutions like deferrals or renegotiations of agreements, these are things you should be considering to see whether there's an opportunity to mitigate issues. Ensure that you're establishing this game plan. This is where your board members may be super helpful. Putting on my volunteer hat, sitting on a number of boards, I know that you know, sometimes I am able to provide advice specifically on some issues that are relevant to the organization, or if not, I can at least point them in the right direction. So leverage the resources in your community and on your boards. Uh, for Forks, again, there's complicated international components to some of these contracts. So again, make sure that you're uh, consulting with people in the correct jurisdictions. Now putting on my real estate and municipal hat, which is my, my primary area of practice, Real property is often, you know, uh, in addition to human resources, one of the largest budget items for an organization. If your organization owns property, make sure that you're communicating with your lenders, communicating with your tenants. And if you're a tenant, tenant communicate with your landlords. There's been a whole host of variety of outcomes in the market, lots of media reporting um, in terms of rent deferrals, rent abatement, you know, business as usual. It's all contextual. You certainly want to make sure that you're considering both the short term and your cash flow, but also the, the long term. And that's where, you know, communication is, is critical. And again, there, there could be varieties of outcomes in the market. So don't, don't overplay your hand as well. Make sure that you've got a thoughtful strategy. With respect to municipal taxes, uh, sometimes those are the tenant's liability. Sometimes they lay with the landlord. Um, and so in that context, you know, you want to consider those as a possible mechanism. Um, in, in that context, um, there are a number of provinces and municipalities that have uh, deferral programs. And maybe on the next slide, if your organization owns the property, ensure that you're reviewing your rights there. Again, sometimes it lands with the landlord. Sometimes these rights sit with the tenant. Um, and make sure that you're evaluating what the potential uh, opportunities are there. Sometimes the classification of the property may be an issue. Uh, with the deferral programs, they're different in each municipality or province. So in Ontario, for example, the education component uh, has been deferred and that's led to sort of an ad hoc approach from different municipalities around the province. On the, on the high level, again, speak with your legal advisors or your tax consultants to ensure you're taking advantage of rebate programs and all your uh, appeal rights to the extent that they exist in each jurisdiction. With respect to employment issues, uh, again, I'm putting on the governance hat here and speaking as someone who sits on a number of boards, I'm not an employment lawyer, but my role is to match folks with, with uh, the right resources. We have a webinar uh, on managing your workforce through crisis. Uh, so that li this link will be available when we circulate this slide deck following the presentation, and it includes topics such as temporary layoffs, Employment Standards Act, job protective leaves, and remote work. Uh, again, contextual analysis required, but there's lots of tools there available on our website. And again, as Colin indicated, critical that we've got a plan on that front. Further on the governance side, annual general meetings is a, a discrete issue that quite a few organizations are running into as a challenge. With the cancellation of large events, Many organizations have canceled their upcoming AGMs, but it's still important that uh, organizations comply with applicable legislation. For federally incorporated not-for-profits, which many sport organizations are, they must hold their annual general meetings within six months of the end of their financial year end. And you, often it's December 31st that's the financial year end, so those AGMs need to be held by June 30th each year. The AGMs must also occur within the 15 months of the previous AGM to comply with the federal legislation. So for federal not-for-profits, first, the meeting must be called under the act if you're gonna do a virtual AGM. Secondly, the bylaws of the not-for-profit corporation must provide for virtual meetings. And third, the medium platform used for this virtual meeting must permit all participants to communicate adequately with each other. So here in this context, Zoom, it's not two-way communication, but there is that capability and there are other tools uh, that may be available. So that may be an option. There's also an option to apply to Corporations Canada for an extension to hold an AGM at a later date. Uh, again, ideally, if you can just comply, but look at all your options. Different considerations, again, under different legislation. 
there's been a variety of approaches that different organizations have taken. There's a British, court, uh, British Columbia Supreme Court decision uh, that granted an order for TELUS to hold a virtual AGM due to COVID-19. Uh, it's not a not-for-profit, but it's just demonstrating there's different options out there. Uh, certainly, you know, you'd want to look and see if there are more cost-efficient uh, solutions as a starting point. Um, uh, but it's just showing that you need to be uh, creative potentially in some contexts. I'm sure the big question is, uh, what do you do if your organization's bylaws do not permit virtual meetings? And this may be the case, particularly if there are older bylaws or uh, bylaws that were prepared without any legal input. Uh, in, in the short term, you should evaluate deferral as an option and evaluate what is permitted under the bylaws and long term look at revising the bylaws to permit virtual AGMs. Again, the mechanisms vary significantly in how you amend your bylaws and whether you know, that may fit into a short term solution. You know, that, that will certainly depend and it's uh, unfortunately, again, highly contextualized uh, as we've seen with a lot of other uh, of these complicated issues. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, right now with boards, and I know that everybody here is putting out fires right now. Uh, I'm not going to get into any detail. I see we're just past one o'clock, so uh, I don't want to hold people late. But governance, if it's something that's been on your to-do list for a long time and you get to a point where employees may be laying idle because operations are just unable to go forward, you know, there may be an opportunity to keep people busy and sort of get some work done on that front. Uh, you certainly want to make sure you're respecting your governance mechanisms that are in place. Uh, but again, if, if there is uh, extra capacity of human resources, which may occur sometimes when we're not able to be, you know, weren't able to be on the slopes at the end of the season or be on the pool deck or, or out, uh, out, out rowing, um, this may be something that's an opportunity. Uh, whenever looking at, at governance, critical that there's collaboration between all stakeholders, including the board, including uh, staff, coaches, um, to just make sure that there's a holistic approach there. Again, we could do a whole presentation on this, but just for today, I just want to put that thought in your head as you're creating your plans around this crisis. So uh, that, that concludes our presentation. I don't want to be outdone by Colin. I, I do want to give a shout out to uh, the swim coaches out there and all the swimming folk uh, that are, uh, it was great to see uh, them register. So uh, shout out to everybody there. And, and thank you everybody for taking the time. As we mentioned, we are recording this webinar. So it will be available on our website typically within 48 hours. Uh, we will be doing our best to provide a consolidated question and answers. I saw some of them were fairly specific. So we'll try and keep it as broad as possible. Um, lots of context, so we're happy to have discussions. Uh, our services can vary from high level strategy to full implementation. And again, it just depends on each issue. So don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, here's our contact info. And on that note, uh, stay healthy, everyone.